Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, our concepts of time, past, present, and future, and um, uh, and also why we need to be accurate and precise about time. Uh, and at some point in history, before we were around, morning was uh, suitable, then we needed to know what hour it was, and now we need to know nanoseconds. And I'm going to hopefully explain to you why anybody cares about this. Um, so one way to look at time is this uh, arc of our lives. Another way to look at it is, uh, is the um, thermodynamic way of uh, entropy and the arrow of time um, always proceeding towards uh, disorder. And then another way to look at it, we're going to look at time a lot of different ways, but another way to look at it is uh, um, through Groucho Marx. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Um, and so um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it sounds a whole lot better when he said it than I did. Um, and, uh, and of course, then there's the other one. Hey, kids, what time is it? It's howdy doody time. <laughs> All right, so um, the circle of life, um, we see, uh, you know, dawn to dusk, it goes around and around and around every day, you know, more or less the same, except for the seasons and so forth. Um, and, you know, how do we know it's noon? Well, one way you know it's noon is when the church bell rings. Another way to know it's noon is when the uh, the noon whistle rings. And, you um, uh, Anyway, I just thought this was a cute little cartoon. And, and uh, uh, you know, just, you know, that, that was, it still is a lot of places. There's still a, some kind of a noon, uh, uh, they test the, the fire siren or something. Um, and uh, then we have always doing uh, time. Uh, on the left is, is a sundial that happens to be right there in, uh, in Greenwich, England. And on the right is a lunar calendar. Um, I forget from where, but uh, people have been worrying about time for a long, long time for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, you know, now we, we um, have calendars and we have clocks and we have uh, fancy stop, uh, fa fancy watches that uh, give us uh, hours, minutes and seconds. Uh, we also, look at time through the cyclical uh, calendar of the year and the seasons. And if you're worried about, if you're a planter, uh, we've always worried about the seasons and when it's time to plant. And uh, since sometime pre-revolution, we've had the Farmer's Almanac still printed. And that's another way that, uh, that people get ideas about the seasons. And uh, and then if, if you want to get a good another way of thinking about the seasons, there's the burpee seed planting um, map. And uh, I guess we're right on the uh, on the uh, on the edge between the uh, the six and the seven, the green and the yellow. Um, but, you know, um, and you can see, by the way, you can look at that map and see on how the uh, uh, the planting seasons uh, uh, shift north on the East Coast because of the, of the uh, Gulf Stream. And that's kind of an interesting way to uh, explain the Gulf Stream to people. So a lot of ways to look at time. Another way, uh, more recently, uh, 120 some years ago, we had timetables like this because you wanted to know when to get the train and the train ran on a certain schedule. And so now we started to get need to have more precision and more accuracy because uh, your watches needed to be coordinated. And that led to the railroads setting up different uh, ways of, of uh, standard time and st time zones. And that led, led us to having um, something called Greenwich Mean Time. And there's the the bar that runs out of the building at Greenwich that, that is the, in fact, the uh, zero meridian. And, um, you know, this was strictly just a matter of arbitrariness based on the fact that at the time, uh, 
all things were centered on Britain and more specifically, everything was centered on London. So Greenwich is a, a nearby suburb of London. And they put together maps of time zones like that. And you can see uh, the vertical bars are the nominal 24 time zones, but you can see that a lot of those things shift around. You'll notice that uh, China, I believe, covers six time zones, but they're all on the same time. Uh, you see um, all sorts of other uh, perturbations where for one reason or another, um, the time zones don't follow the, the vertical uh, lines of chopping up the globe into 24 hours. Um, and here's what we have today with uh, a lot of um, funny lines in order to, um, well, a good example is uh, if you look at, at Chicago and Gary, Indiana, that chunk of Indiana is, is in, in central time zone because they're uh, really functionally suburban Chicago. And then you got the grayed out area in Arizona, which is uh, Arizona doesn't, that port of, portion of Arizona doesn't believe in daylight savings time. So a lot of different uh, strangeness. And one thing that in particular uh, fascinates me is if you take the, uh, the Eastern time zone and go all the way from the uh, very eastern tip of Maine, clear over to that uh, western part of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. That's a heck of a lot of, of uh, east to west. And um, if you're a Maine person, your, your view of when the sun sets in the summer is vastly different than somebody who's in, in western Michigan. Um, when I go on vacation here in a couple of weeks to right about there, if you can see my cursor, um, we don't, the sun won't set till even mid August. It won't set till the end of uh, um, about 10 o'clock. So um, that's another way to look at time. Moving along, uh, these are all different things that we've all had in our lives the uh, Big Ben alarm clock, uh, wristwatch, time clock, and the school clock, all of which um, were perfectly good enough until very recently. We could just, that was what we did. And if you wanted to have somebody tell you what time it was, even in 1937, we had a woman um, speaking the time into a microphone. Um, I got to think that had to be one of the worst telephone jobs ever. I don't know. Uh, and then finally, somebody figured out on the left hand side, they figured out how to record it. Uh, and we all remember calling that number up and getting and then and setting our watch according to the um, according to what. Uh, what that said. So, uh, and, you know, that was, that was good enough a few years ago and, but it's not good enough now. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is. Uh, first of all, let's talk about something that's on everybody's mind, which is the Olympics. And it was 12 years ago that Usain Bolt, uh, uh, set that world record and look at how, how far out in front of the guys he is. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to, you know, in order to deal with the Olympic swimming, running, etc., you got to have more precision than the old, the good old stopwatch that you see here, uh, just doesn't cut it in this day and age. And so you have these electronics. And if you start down at the lower left, the, the, the starting blocks all have their speakers so that each individual hears the starting gun at the same time. There's no bias between the distance from the, from the starting gun. And then that all goes into a time console. And then there's a, a photodiode array that figures out who crossed the finish line at what point and, um, you know, registers that. And then you get something Read, read out like this. And in this case, it must be uh, a long race because it's an hour and 43 minutes, but it's out to the thousandth of a second. So that's how the racing timing works. And of course, it's a little different in, uh, say, swimming where there's a touch pad that you have to hit. Um, but, you know, it's all electronic. And, and in this day and age, we just simply are not going to accept, um, you know, what we saw Within our lifetimes, a, 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 uh, uh, people with stopwatches and, and judges at the finish line arguing over who crossed the, uh, crossed the line first and then looking at the photo finish. Remember the word photo finish? Um, so um, 
that's part of the reason why we need to have more accurate timing now. Um, let's go back to history again. Uh, how the heck did we get to a 24 hour day, 60 minutes, 60 seconds and milliseconds? Well, uh, what I was able to find is that the, the 12 hours of the day was basically your day as opposed to your night. And the way they counted to 12 was the Egyptians used base 12 and it's, it's the digits on your finger, as you see in that illustration. Um, the 60 minutes uh, came from astronomers in Babylonia. Uh, why they did that is lost in the mist of time. And the, the 60 seconds is just simply a derivation of, of the 60 minute uh, concept. Um, and then because we got more precise, we went into milliseconds and that's just straight the modern def decimal system. So why are we using this base 24, base 60? Well, that's as good an answer as I'm going to give you today. There's, there's more details on, on the history there, but um, we're moving along. So why don't we just use a base 10 uh, decimal time? And in fact, people have talked about it and the French instituted it. Uh, in 1792, and then they had this little revolution that came along about four years later, and they abandoned it. But they did have it actually uh, for a while, and, and it, it's 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 a workable system. Um, the decimal minute is 1.4 of our minutes, so you know the gut feeling of a minute, if we were to use decimal time, wouldn't be that far off. But it's never taken on, and 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 then there's there's big articles in Wikipedia and stuff about various people who've advocated that, and it's uh, uh, kind of in the same realm as uh, when the heck are, are we going to switch over from uh, English units to uh, metric units, which is another whole topic that I occasionally obsess with too. Um, anyway, that's why we have the 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 clocks we have now in the in the counting systems. Um, the way to tell time, a lot of different ways to do it. There's sand clocks, water clocks, um, you know, on and on and on. But I'm going to focus on oscillators. And the classic oscillator is the pendulum and a grandfather clock. Um, more recently, 1964, some of you probably even had one of these. This was the height of technology in 1964 was a, an actual tuning fork here in the, in the bottom with the tine and uh, the electronics uh, let the tuning fork resonate. And that's how it, it generated moving the, uh, the gears and so forth, then moved the, uh, the hands around on the clock. Um, and then somebody got the bright idea of using a quartz uh, crystal to, to oscillate. And here's a picture of an early one of those and a more recent one that's embedded in a integrated circle circuit and the, the so the grandfather clock was roughly i'm just making this up about one second to back and forth tick 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 uh this guy was 360 hertz this guy was over 32,000 hertz and this guy is somewhere around a million hertz so the the precision uh got better with these these technologies over the last uh, say half a century or so and um, so the computer clock, the, uh, the quartz oscillator, the definition is, 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 is a, uh, uh, the frequency with which the uh, generator generates pulses. So it's just a frequency of pulses. And then inside the uh, C CPU, the central processing unit, oops, sorry. Um, now I don't know what to do here. Mitch, do you have left and right arrows on your keypad? That'll do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the clock rate is just simply uh, this crystal oscillating and, and the CPU counting the oscillations. The definition of this SI second, you can read it below, but basically it's the frequent, the, the period of uh, cesium-133 um, at that nine billion blah, blah, blah um, periods of radiation. And so um, that's the SI definition. 
Um, another important thing that came up in the 1960s was the network time protocol. And this was um, a way to synchronize between all of the different computer clocks. And, you know, it was one master clock and then it broadcast out to all of the different slave clocks. And this is one of the more, the older internet protocols since 1985. Um, designed by a uh, computer scientist at uh, University of Delaware, actually. Um, and I'm going to talk next week about the whole <laughs> position, navigation, and timing architecture and using all of this stuff to figure out where we are. That's next week's conversation. But right now, I'm going to stick on time. Um, so the GPS that we all know and love that's in our our cell phones and so forth, is accurate to something on the order of uh, 40 nanoseconds, 90%, 95% of the time. The definition is, is in the fine print there. Um, and uh, like I said, about 40, 40 nanoseconds. So that's how accurate your, your phone is. Um, so uh, you can't actually uh dissociate the clock in your phone from the uh the um time signals and and you can let your you can set your clock like we used to do you know five minutes ahead or whatever but basically you know your phone unless you actually fiddle with the innards of it this is uh you know accurate to within uh, 40 nanoseconds and the reason we need that is for positioning and so forth that we'll talk about next week um Going back in time, 1949, there's a couple of gentlemen at the National Bureau of Standards who had the first atomic clock. And then uh, the way that they did that was with um, filtering through a micro, microwave uh, cavity and a frequency divider down at the bottom. And then, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, and then uh, a digital counter and a servo mechanism to uh, move the clock forward, the physical readout. And more recently, this is the kind of uh, a, a cartoon of the way a cesium uh, atomic clock works. And you can see the, the uh, cesium needs to be heated up on the lower, the lower left. And, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that you guys all remember, big uh, Newport tables in, in your laboratory at, at Bell Labs and so forth. Uh, but that's basically uh, the, the, the setup in order to make a, uh, an atomic clock work. And um, in, the, in 2014, uh, they miniaturized all that stuff we saw in the last thing that looked like it was about 20 feet long down to, you know, a couple of millimeters. And uh, you can see this is, uh, you know, a, a breadboard type thing with uh, wired on uh, wires and so forth. And uh, basically uh, a laser at the bottom, optics, uh, the the cesium cell, and then the photodiode at the top to give you your readout. And so that was, that was a few years ago. More recently, this is University of Singapore, and they use uh, not cesium, but lutetium for reasons that I don't know why. And they're down to uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is a, uh, you know, this takes you guys back. Actually, oscilloscopes, this was in 2019, but still you see all the oscilloscopes across the top and millions and millions of, uh, uh, I shouldn't say millions, dozens of uh, um, laser waveguides and so forth down across the, uh, the table at the bottom. So um, the research continues. I know uh, NIST, I, I heard, heard a kind of, uh, presentation from a guy at NIST at, at Boulder that, had, that was working on 10 to the minus 17 seconds. And um, same kind of a setup, lots and lots of uh, wires and lasers and so forth. Um, today for 1500 bucks, you can buy this particular 
chip scale atomic clock, you can see the size comparing to a quarter. And it's 10 to the minus 11th accuracy. Um, it will, it ages at only about 10 to the minus ninth per month. So that's, um, it's pretty long lived. Um, you know, you can see the, the weight and the power requirements and they think that this is worth $200 million in sales at 1500 bucks uh, a pop uh, for various people who need a, uh, an atomic clock of, of that accuracy. And over on the side, you can just see the various uh, uh, components that go into this CSAC um, component. Um, and so uh, should you need the uh, uh, accuracy, you can get it for 1500 bucks today. Um, and so the specs of our time that we use from uh, the satellites that we get, um, and I'm just showing this to you guys to show you that I that there there's there's some fairly geeky stuff here, but um, they they do a dual frequency uh, broadcast, and they use a CDMA. There are four known unknowns, and and uh, you know the X Y Z plus time, and so they need at least four satellites in order to solve that by at least squares. Um, solution. There are more exotic solutions, but I just uh, stopped at the least squares. Um, anyway, so that's that's how um, the the time signals um, are used to, to, to generate the XYZ uh, uh, position. And um, at this point with uh, carrier phase tracking, you can, this is not routine, but you can get um, plate uh, a two millimeter accuracy, and that's enough that you can um, track any plate tectonics that move less than 100 millimeters a year. 100 millimeters is what, like that? So, um, and uh, so, uh, and I think in plate te tectonics, that's a that's a that's a pretty sorry, 100 millimeters. That's a that's a pretty uh, fast moving plate, but still, um, that's the kind of stuff we're doing now with uh, uh, with the accuracy of, of uh, uh, our our um, GPS uh, uh, atomic clocks, and uh, um, and of course we have uh, uh, stopwatches that we can you know we now have that that on our uh, on our cell phone. Um, you know, you can, you can take laps and do all the stuff you used to do with the mechanical ones, but it's all in your cell phone now. Um, and, you know, in an average day, the average American uses their cell phone about four or five hours. And I'm sure a couple of years ago, you guys are going, are you kidding me? I never, maybe, I never use it more than an hour. Well, first of all, it actually clocks the time that you use it and you'd be surprised how much how much time you use it uh and secondly uh you know the old guard is not the average smartphone user so um and um that's a quick whirlwind tour here um uh, there's several things that i have not covered uh there's a whole issue of, of rel relative relativity uh, it goes to black holes and Big Bang where time dilates and, and goes to infinity or zero, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I touched on daylight savings time, uh, the logic of it in terms of, um, uh, you know, kids getting out of school during daylight and the politics of it and whether we should go to permanent daylight savings time which in my mind is just a, a giant lie. Um, I haven't covered that. And the other thing is uh, time travel. Uh, we go back into history and, sci and science fiction. Um, Rip Van Winkle slept for 18 years, right? Woke up and the world was different. Uh, and, and, and Scrooge and the Christmas Carol uh, goes back in time, forward in time and, and you know, in the, in the present in his um, in being guided by the ghost of Christmas past 
future and present. And so he, he moves around in time and there's lots and lots of examples of, 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 of time travel in, in science fiction. And one more that I just want to point out there is, uh, this is, I don't know, 25 years ago, this movie came out, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And, and Bill and Ted are on the, on the right there. They're, they're a couple of California slackers that are, are, are stoners or something. They're just kind of goofballs. And here they are. They travel back in time and they're meeting this guy named Socrates. And Socrates is talking to them about the uh, sands of sands of the hourglass and the days of our lives. And these guys are going, oh, cool, man. Whoa, four zero. Oh. <laughs> But I just love that the whole the play. On, I just love the fact that these guys called him Socrates. Um, and finally, you know, there's wormholes and all sorts of other things that they use in science fiction to get you from here to there and no time at all and uh, so forth. And then um, winding up, a couple of quotes from Einstein. Um, you know, he, he maintained that the time and space are not. What conditions we, in which we live, but modes by which we think. Um, physical concepts are free creations of the human mind and are not, however it may seem, determined by the external world. And then another quote from him, we invented time. Time is what the clock said. Um, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly present, persistent illusion. Uh, whether it's illusion or reality, you know, that gets into some philosophy and we can talk about that later, but uh, that's what Einstein had to say. And again, you know, this is beyond what I want to talk about today. And so to wind up, I, asked, I wanted to know, um, just, just kind of explain to you guys why we care about precision and time like this. And first of all, position, navigation, and timing, it, you, you need to know when you are in order to know where you are. And that's important. We'll talk about that next week on the, the PNT uh, discussion. Um, anything that requires split second timing, uh, like stock trading, uh, not too many years ago, uh, the stock market people used to tape a, a cell phone to the window to get good, good cell reception in order to use that cell phone for uh, timing the stock trading. Uh, now, of course, it's all hardwired in, but, um, and uh, all kinds of chemistry and physics happens at, at nanoseconds or faster rates. Um, you know, there are many, many chemical reactions that happen on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 15 seconds or so. Uh, so, you know, if you can time, then you can start viewing those, those phenomena. Um, we use it to control our uh, TV broadcast frequency. And, um, you know, as we get into the future, once we get good at this uh, business of, of precision time measuring, it's, it helps us, you know, with gravity, uh, electric fields, all of the things you see there. Uh, and so we'll get more and more precise. And in some cases, well, like anything that we've seen in our, our careers, um, you never, you never know why you need a capability until you got it. And then all of a sudden people find applications. So, um, next week I'm going to talk about where am I and get somewhere beyond hide and seek pretty quickly with that one. And, um, okay. Half an hour time for some discussion. Okay. Uh, the first hand up is Mark Edelman. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I have three questions. Uh, uh, first of all, what is the precise time next week when we should hear you again? And I want this down to the nanosecond. Well, we can't tell because we don't know how long the old guard meeting is going to last first. Okay. Anyway, my, my next, <laughs> next thing I want to say is that time is always measured by something else. Uh, generally speaking, time is measured by motion. So even if you're using time to measure something, the measurement of time itself always starts with something that isn't time. And that's just an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. 
Um, and then uh, the third thing I want to say, which is just a little bit of nostalgia, is that, you know, when we were kids, the electric clock on the wall or by the bedside, uh, usually they were made by General Electric, um, they had a motor inside. And the motor was what they call a synchronous motor. And it was designed to rotate in synchrony with the 60 cycle electric current. And the great thing about that was that over at the generating plant, they had these great big generators, which were running at 60 cycles. But of course, they would drift a little bit. But what they did was <clears throat> they had measure, ways of measuring the drift, and then they would correct it over the course of the day. The result of that was that actually your old fashioned electric clock was accurate, probably down to a fraction of a second. As long as the electricity was not interrupted uh, your clock would stay exactly as accurate as you had set it down to a fraction of a second as long as the motor ran and I had I had an electric bedroom clock that ran for about 25 years um, and it was used every day a ma an amazing piece of engineering and uh, completely accurate unless the electricity stopped i was just going to say mark until we have a power just because of a thunderstorm yeah yeah okay, next up is alejo um this is al mccray is time is time absolute does it vary according to your environment as in the case of the twin paradox and GPS, we've got to make corrections to the time. So it, how is it affected by gravity and your local environment? Well, that gets into relativistic thing. And of course, at the other end of the, of the philosophical spectrum, Al, is, is uh, our perceptions of time are all different. And we've, you know, we all, you know, have a, a mental idea of how long 10 seconds is. But if you do the uh, exercise of pushing a stopwatch every 10 seconds, you find out that you, uh, um, you're not, you know, you're not quite consistent, but, uh, and people who've been in, uh, in, uh, completely, uh, deprived environments, uh, like, in you know, they, they do do psych experiments and people get into a, uh, a mine or something like that. And they, their, their perception of 24 hours starts to drift after, days and weeks so but to the the issue you had asked al um you know that that gets into the relativistic issues and you know in in normal human experience you know a minute is a minute an hour is an hour but you know when you get into um you know we've done the experiments with uh, fast plane travel and atomic clocks and found you know differences in nanoseconds and so forth but um anyway uh Beyond beyond where I want to go right now, Al Hayo, you probably want to go there. Uh, in, in fact, this is uh, exactly the direction I was uh, wondering. I've been perplexed by time uh, throughout my life, and I was uh, I hadn't heard those quotes that Einstein uh, you put up, uh, but I sympathize with him that maybe time is a man-made notion, not a absolute notion in physics, but from a physics perspective, um, what is your thinking? Can we travel forward and backward in time? Is that possible in physics? Well, first of all, I'm your resident chemist, not your resident physicist. <laughs> uh, so I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not by any means uh, qualified to answer that question. Um, you know, in, in a practical sense, uh, you know, um, how do you answer this? I'm not going to buy any stock in a uh, time travel company. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, 
you know, I, you know um, and but the other thing is what we've learned in the last 150 years or something, particularly in physics and astronomy and so forth, is never say never, right? So, um, you know, there might be something that that pops out at us sometime. But, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, all of the stuff, you know, the Star Trek uh, um, portals and so forth, um, like I said, I'm not buying stock in any of those kind of companies. I don't know. You, you guys are the physicists. You, uh, you know, don't ask me. But uh, from a, a practical perspective, um, we now have to make relativistic corrections for GPS. Yep. So there is something going on here. And uh, I just wonder who or what is controlling the speed of the arrow of time. <laughs> Keep wondering, Al. <laughs> yeah, I think I have to. I Thank you. I the answer anytime soon, but who knows what the future brings. Back to Edelman's original question about when we start a week from now, it's really simple. I start one second after Tom says go. <laughs> okay, next up is George Cole. Hey Mitch, good, great talk. Um, I have a, um, actually two questions. One is a statement and the other is a question. For all you ham uh, operators and, uh, and uh, listeners, you all know, good old WWV uh, and uh, CHU Canada uh, are both time standards, which you mentioned. Uh, but I just came across an article that the government has defunded all the WWVs. So the uh, one in uh, Colorado and the other one in Hawaii, we're going to stop getting the signals. So if you want to rely on a time source, for example, a lot of people have these um, uh, atomic wristwatches, atomic uh, clocks in their house that are set using WWV. Uh, you're going to have to uh, change that probably fairly soon. Uh, the, the, the answer that I was reading was that they're going to be putting in GPS and all the all those clocks. And again, you, as you said, use the satellite uh, to uh, to sync them up. The the question I really have is and that's getting to the other spectrum of time uh, as to what it is. And the question is, is time quantized? Um, that's a debate that's been going on in physics for a long time. Um, so do you have any, well, let, let's put it out to all the physicists out there. Uh, what about quantized time? I'm going to referee this one and not answer. Anybody got a? <laughs> I, I actually, I read a book back in the nineties about, you know, thinking in physics, you know, and this one person actually, actually brought up you know, where the time was quantized and I guess they call it tachyons or some, something like that. And, uh, you know, I actually had a conversation with my father about it and he, um, he basically says to the present knowledge, there's no evidence for it. Um, the one thing I like to say is there's this notion of Planck time, which is something like 10 to the minus, I forget what it is, 20, minus 25 seconds which is, um, you know, Planck took all the constants we have and made them one and then figured out what a unit distance is and a unit time is and all that kind of stuff. So if we could see, if it was quantized, we have to see basically down to Planck time. And as, as of current <coughs> technology, they've gotten close to it, but not as, that close. So they're still kind of far away from be able, being able to determine that. But I thought it was uh, kind of an interesting idea because we deal with electronic circuits all the time, digitals, everything's quantized. You know, why not? You know, maybe if uh, energy levels are quantized, 
Why isn't time quantized? So it's an interesting thought. You're just simply saying, Walt, that uh, there's a limit to how many how many uh, uh, sparse parsing time down to milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, et cetera. And then you get, eventually get to the point where you can't split it up anymore, just like you can't split below, say, a quark. Yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, they've developed very elaborate camera systems that can capture things at finer and finer levels. So maybe they can even capture things, you know, at molecular levels. You know, you said like uh, chemical reactions occur in nanoseconds, okay? But that's still quite a bit away from Planck time. And, uh, you know, I, I guess it's still up in the air whether that can exist or not. So far, there's really no good theory that I've come across that says there could be quantized time, but, you know, I guess it's uh, wait and see what future research brings. Well, you know, that's uh, that's why we have uh, schools and, and PhD theses um, in order to, you know, generate, uh, you know, have, have all the kids nowadays uh, generate PhD theses on something like that. Um, who's up next? I guess John Tomaszewski. Yeah, Tom Forrester was was up next. Oh. Paul Egger was up next, but I, he seems to have disappeared. So, John Tom, Tomaszewski. Well, I have a question for Mitch. How come when I was seven years old and it was uh, November, it seemed like Christmas took forever to happen? And now that I'm a little older, it seems like it's January. And the next thing I know, Christmas is right around the corner. Uh, that's real simple. It's called time dilation. Um, yeah, you know, like, um, you know, we, we do perceive time completely differently at, at, in many things, you know, and, you know, a, there's a lot of psychology associated with the boredom and so forth. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the exercise, it's really, really quite easy. And you can do that on your on your smartphone very easily is to just sit down with your uh, the stopwatch function and uh, hit the lap timer at 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. And you'll find yourself, uh, see whether or not you, you are, you are uh, drift, you drift. I just did it yesterday and I drifted from nine seconds to 13 seconds over about 10 repetitions. So it's a, it's, that's an interesting one. Of course, that's uh, that's a a mini version of, of your issue of of when Christmas is coming, John. But it, it, absolutely, you know, we all, and of course, you know, uh, there are memories we all have that seem like they were yesterday, and memories that uh, were fairly recent, but they seem like they were years and years and years ago. So, um, where are, where are we? Who's next? Uh, well, let me just, let me add to a comment to that. One of the theories that I've um, heard that kind of makes sense to me is that when you're seven years old, um, you know, a month is whatever percent that is, you know, five percent of your of your life experiences. And when you're sixty-seven years old, it's a much much smaller percentage, so that it appears to go relative to what you've experienced. It appears to go a lot faster. I think that's worth thinking about and has some merit. Anyway, um, next up is Bill Tittle. I'm sorry, Griff, Griff Smith. I, it's a lighter color, I didn't notice it. Griff, you're next. My map. Okay, I think I understand what the uh, time issue is on the saddle, the relativistic uh, correction on the satellites is time proceeds slower in a higher gravitational field. And the limit in the black hole, time stops completely. The satellites for the GPS system are well above the surface of the Earth. Therefore, the time proceeds faster. And there has to be a, a relativistic uh, correction for this in order to get the timing correct. OK. I'd like to add, uh, add something to this Planck time. I just looked it up. Planck time is 10 to the minus 44 seconds, but the smallest time interval that was measured 
was 10 to the minus 21 seconds. So we're still quite a bit away from being able to measure Planck time. And each, each uh, order of magnitude uh, is increasingly difficult in the uh, technology of actually making the measurement. So going from 10 to the minus 21 to 10 to the minus 22, you know, is hard. You know, when it gets exponentially harder, you, uh, the farther you, you know, split it down. So like you said, well, we're not, we're not going to have 10 to the minus 43 seconds anytime soon with the technologies that we got. The other thing is, um, in, term, in terms of correcting for relativistic time, uh, when they were designing picture tubes back in the days when television still had picture tubes, they, you know, the speed of the electron is something like 80% of the speed of light. And they found out to get sharper picture tubes that had to correct for the relativistic effects of, of electron travel. I don't know if anybody knew that, but. Okay, next up is Bill Tittle. You're muted, Bill. I'm gonna make three observations. Uh, first of all, um, I think there's a physical aspect to humans' perception of time in the sense that if I stepped out on my porch today, which is like 90 degrees, um, and my whole physical functioning kind of slows down and I have a hard enough time keeping awake and perception of time would change uh, completely. The second is that um, uh, if we actually were able to do time travel, we'd have to speed uh, to, we'd have to travel uh, at greater than the speed of light. Um, and that I think is physically impossible. So I'm, I'm coming around to Einstein's idea that the concept of time is just a, uh, a human invention for convenience. And so the notion of something non-physical uh, being quantized has no meaning to me. That's it. Okay, um, then next is uh, Herb Waddell. Uh, yeah, uh, actually our concept of time has a genetic basis too. Uh, I recently read something about a couple of college professors who were investigating people who can't sleep. And it drives them crazy and they spend fortunes on, on sleeping aids and they feel rotten if they don't get their eight hours to 10 hours of sleep. But they discovered a subset of people, and I'm one of them, but I'm not in their study, who get by just fine on six hours and they wake up and they're, they're good to go. And they don't have trouble sleeping generally. So they had found that people who have sleep disorders have mutations in certain genes, two or three of them. And they, now they're investigating people like me who have those mutations, but apparently with, with other complications. So, these genes apparently regulate our internal clock and they affect how we react to jet travel, you know, travel to another time zone, changing your schedule from uh, the routine to one that's shifted by several hours. Uh, and so it's interesting. I look forward to learning more about this internal clock we have that gives us a concept of time. and. Uh, uh, I find that I have a pretty good idea at any particular time what time it is within usually 10 minutes or so of the real time. Um, uh, that's the internal clock, I guess. We all have them, but they work in different ways. Well, that's my observation on how we perceive time and why. Mm -hmm. Okay, next then is Steve Arley. Uh, Mitch, intriguing talk, but I'm a little disappointed that you uh, don't believe in time travel. <clears throat> you know, I would think if we could get a hold of a 1981 DeLorean, 
Ah. We could probably prove that Doc Brown was right. I thought about throwing him in there, but I I, I like Bill and Ted better just because of Socrates. That just cracked. It's always cracked me up. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, there's there's got to be dozens. I didn't I didn't look and and uh, you know catalog it. I'm sure Wikipedia has a an entry on time travel movies, but there's there's hundreds of them, and it, it's a it's a great um, it's a great uh, way you know it's a great tactic to to give yourself all sorts of uh uh liberty in terms of making a movie and one of the interesting things in terms of time travel and movies is that uh when they actually shoot a movie uh they don't they don't shoot it in the in the order that we see it that you know they they all shoot different pieces of it in any 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 order based on production schedules and where they are and whatever else they need and so forth. So, you know, and then it gets pieced together. So the actors have to time travel, so to speak, as they go, because they're today we're filming the the scene that's 90, 90 minutes in the movie and tomorrow we're filming the scene that's 15 minutes in the movie. Um, so to that extent, sure, we have time travel. And, um, um, you know, and of course, we always have the, uh, uh, the creative state legislatures that pass the... Uh, uh, the law, at, 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 you know, the, the budget at, at 11.59 p.m. when, in, but everybody else's clock say 1.30. <laughs> they get up there and they sh shove the clock back. But um, anyway, yeah, I, so um, yeah, I, I could have put the DeLorean in here, but I just didn't. How do you know it's not so crates? <laughs> Damn it, Herb, you're always confusing things. <laughs> okay, next is Mark Edelman. Yes, um, I just wanted to mention the phenomenon of perfect pitch. You know, some people have the gift of perfect pitch, which means that um out of the blue from from isolation they could tell you what note a sound is um and if they can sing they could sing that note uh and that suggests to me that uh in the brain somehow there's a pretty good clock even if we don't always have access to it. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Mm -hmm. Similar to uh, a different time scale, but similar to Herb's uh, notion that he can tell within 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Bill Tittle? Yeah, I wanted to react to um, Herb's uh, idea. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a genetic component. and. Her uh, only requires six hours of sleep at night uh, to feel, you know, to feel normal. Um, I require more than that, and I think it's a there's a temperamental um, component to this that I'm uh, by nature a kind of a, you know, a, a high, perhaps. Uh, manic kind of guy, uh, where Herb is much more easygoing. Now, I think I just get pooped out by, in my body more than than Herb would. So there's physical, uh, sort of physical temperamental component. That's it. Okay, Griff. The professors said that these genetic mutations are also associated with a type A personality, people who are, always have to be doing things and they want to mm. get things done. And so, you know, what is our personality? <laughs> it's, yeah. A lot of it is genetic. Griff, okay. Uh, I'll tell you the bit about the hearing 
because I suffer from it. Uh, it's not a clock. It's a set of neurons in the inner ear that um, represent a particular perceptual pitch in your brain. Unfortunately, my right ear has a problem that uh, changes the um, neurons that are stimulated but because the, uh, the, the, the shape of my inner ear is distorted. And it, uh, as a result, the resonance happens with the neuron neurons and I hear a half note sharp at middle C. So uh, it's, it's not really, it is a clock in a sense, but it's really whether you have that particular set of neurons which excite a particular part of your auditory cortex that tells you what your perceptual pitch is. And my perceptual pitch is distorted now. Yeah, other than that- I have to send you to be recalibrated. <laughs> exactly, that, that's really what it is. And uh, I, I had, I don't think I had perfect kit pitch, but I was damn close to it. And now my pitch is off by uh, about a half note on my right side. Okay, next is George. Just to uh, clarify something that Bill said about going faster than the speed of light. Uh, it's not that we can't go faster than the speed of light. That's actually allowed and, um, and uh, mathematically possible. Uh, the problem is you can't go as fast as the speed of light. Again, it takes infinite energy to get to that. But then that gets back to the uh, whole concept of can time, is time quantized? And uh, if it is, can you have quantum tunneling through the speed of light so that you would get to the other side. Uh, those are things that people who are trying to say, yes, we can do faster than light travel are uh, arguing that it is possible to get there. At what physical scale, George? We're, we're talking, um, we're not talking about like, a, a, like your human body squeezing through a, uh, uh quantum tunneling right right <laughs> uh yeah we're talking about can they actually see particles that are traveling as fast as the speed of light and then go into a uh, uh a time reversal <clears throat> well okay. we might just mention that of course light travels at the speed of light and uh, it was Einstein, I guess, who first talked about the idea that if you could ride on a photon, no time would be passing. And the photons that existed at the beginning of the universe, if they haven't been destroyed, are still at that time. Uh, their time hasn't changed for them. Uh, yeah, that makes that fits. Alan Chenoweth. <clears throat> yeah, I'm about having a wrong remarking about particles going faster than the speed of light um, in a very um, narrow sense. That is achievable if you um, accelerate an electron up to something close to the speed of light. Um, and then have it um, uh, go into a block of glass or something, which um, uh, where because of the refractive index, the speed of light is um, uh, much lower. Um, so that um, instantaneously, until the um, electron slows down, is fasting is passing um, uh, is traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, of course, it sheds that um, uh, energy um, in the form of 
Cherenkov radiation. Okay. okay. There actually are two questions in the um, chat, one by Tom Forager, Forager and the other by Al Aho. Do either of you want to bring those up since we still have time? I guess not. Well, I think I think Al's might have been just rhetorical in terms of the brood X uh, cicadas taken yeah. 17 years. Uh, um, you know, well, I'm sure some botanists are working on how, how they know that. Well, well it's uh, I was fascinated by this discussion of uh, people with perfect pitch. A long time ago, when I was at Bell Labs, the director of the Acoustics Research Center, Max Matthews, who I suspect a number of you have known, uh, did an experiment to see how accurately a violinist could play a note on high up on the E string. And uh, the professional violinist that he enlisted for his experiment could, with amazing accuracy, put their finger down on the fingerboard and almost dead, at, dead on with the right frequency of the note. Uh, so is it physical that they know that that's the position they should have their finger on because on a violin you don't have frets? Or is their brain instinctively, if they hit the wrong note, quickly moving it before we can detect that they didn't come on the right pitch? So biologically, we have some very mysterious and innate abilities of being able to tell time. Some people can say, okay, I can predict how long uh, it will be before two minutes is up and do it with uncanny accuracy and without a watch, where some people have no concept of how long two minutes is. So food for thought. Isn't well, that muscle that memory? Isn't that muscle memory for a violinist? Just for hours and hours of practice. I, I just want to point out that, um, and maybe this is a good way to close this off, is that uh, we've, we've ranged all over every, all sorts of different topics just in the last half hour. And a lot of, uh, you know, very heady physics in terms of, uh, you know, what exactly is time all about on a physics sense. Uh, but I think Al just pointed out that that the uh, every time we talk about any kind of science, um, we think uh, we think all the sciences are complicated, and then we get into uh, biology and and psychology, and that gets way way more complicated. Good example is uh, how complicated the CRISPR world is compared to uh, uh, much simpler um, ways of computing. So uh, it, the the biology. Uh, always ends up being more complicated than, 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 than the other sciences. My two cents. Well, Steve Barley has his hand up yet, so why don't we go to him and then we'll close. Uh, just, a, just a quick thought, uh, some incredible topics here for me as, a, uh, as a non-scientist in terms of uh, uh, time, in terms of uh, energy required to move you faster than speed of light. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, uh, there's a, a recent book, Andy Weir's book called Project Hail Mary, where some of these concepts are actually discussed. Uh, Weir's uh, name is spelled W-E-I-R, and his book, again, Project Hail Mary, is, uh, has been on the uh, New York Times bestsellers list. As a non-scientist, non uh, I read it recently and found it fascinating, and uh, you might as well. What was the first name? Andy. Andy. Andy Weir, W-E-I-R. I noticed Griff's hand is up now too. So Griff, you want to go yet? You're muted, Griff. So I'm, I'm a retired uh, trombone player. Same situation as a violin. Uh, you have to move the slide to a particular spot in order to get the proper re resonance frequency for a particular note. Uh, 
I was able to do that very accurately. To some extent, I did it by calibrating my position relative to the bell by touching the edge of the bell as I went by. But I, I can only do that for a narrow range. Other than that, I have to know where to put that <clears throat> bell, uh, that, that slide, so that I hear the particular note that I want to hear. And I think I was pretty good at doing it. And now I notice Herb Waddell has his hand up again. So Herb, do you have something to add? I just want to say when you guys get a little older, you'll find <laughs> that your hearing changes a lot. I don't have satellite service on my car because I liked the big band music. And when I hear it today, it's discordant because I'm not getting the upper registers and when I'm not getting the harmonics. Uh, now, that isn't true of all of the old time, you know, 40s and 50s big band songs because some of them don't use a lot of high pitched uh, notes, but, but it, 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 it's, it's not pleasant. And uh, Griff's uh, pitch is maybe a little, evidence of that. The, uh, our ears break down with age, most, most of us anyway, and you will find that the upper register disappears. And I discovered this when a grandson played a song on a grand piano and it didn't sound right to me and I couldn't believe that he made a mistake. So after he was, he was through, I went over and I hit the highest note on the keyboard and I didn't hear a thing. And that was the explanation for why I didn't enjoy it when he got into the upper register. So, you know, what, what we hear, it, it depends on what we're listening with, as well as, uh, as well as how we process it in the brain. That's a, that's a sad note to end on. Yeah, hearing aids do help with that somewhat. Yes, but not, not enough. True. Okay, um, Mitch, thank you very much. Obviously you inspired a lot of discussion and a lot of interesting topics that come up and we look forward to having you join us again next week and tell us where we are. Um, we'll, we'll get lost again next week on that topic. And I want all of you to know that Mitch volunteered this. I didn't seek him out to do these things. He was such a good guy that he just um, wrote me a note saying, this is not the expecting. I'm volunteering to do these if you're interested. So I commend you, Mitch, for doing that for us all. And My pleasure. Uh, hey, thanks, Mitch. Good job, Mitch. Yep. My pleasure.